afternoon. And uh, thank you for, for being here and joining us. Um, I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Um, as most of you know, the center opened in March of 2007, and our mission to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions and to educate new generations about the meaning of feminist art and to maintain a dynamic learning facility, which this forum has become for us, to present discussions on feminist activism and feminist art. And we have, over the past year and a half, had um, five news-making, actually, exhibitions and scores of lectures and panel discussions. And we continue to influence uh, supporting feminist artists and women artists in museums and also in the marketplace. So it's very happy moment in time as we go towards this new year. Uh, we'll be having our second anniversary in March and it has been a very, very good year and a half. Uh, since Maura Riley, the founding curator of the uh, center has left, uh, Lauren Ross is our interim curator. She's here with us today and this uh, lecture would not have been possible without Lauren, so I want to thank her very much for her commitment and her assistance to making this happen. First Saturdays at the museum, as many of you know, are um, quite extraordinary, and it takes an entire staff of an entire museum to prepare for the crowds that descend upon us in a couple of hours. And so uh, it was Lauren's commitment to this exhibition and to the center that made it possible for us to be here. And um, also that we'll be taping this uh, lecture so that we can put it on our website um, during the um, run of the exhibition. And um, Hannah Wilkie, Sculptor and Sculpture, uh, is going to be presented by, um, by Tracy Fitzpatrick, as I say, plus one, and you will see why in a moment for those of you who don't know already. And I'm delighted to have this as an invitational uh, lecture in honor of Hannah Wilke. And we have the magnificent rosebud outside. It's lent by the Arthur M. Sackler Collections Trust for the benefit and in honor of the center, and that it is being included in the current exhibition, Burning Down the House, uh, building a feminist collection is uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. So um, I was going to go into a whole long mystery of life, having run into Tommy Schwartz, which means you know how long I've known him because most people know him as either Tom or Thomas Schwartz, who's president um, of SUNY Purchase at the Newberger Museum, which is where Tracy hails from. And uh, I ran into him at an art table lunch, and, and a couple of weeks later, I had invited him to a party at my house, and a couple of weeks later, I received a letter from the Newburger asking for assistance for their absolutely fabulous and fantastic Hannah Wilkie gestures, uh, which is up in the moment. And um, so I returned the call, and it was Tracy, and I did what I could to assist in public programming for it. And um, Tommy came to my house for the party, and I said, I said, well, I, um, I, you know, I did respond positively to the letter. He said, what letter? I know, I know, it's marvelous. So see, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, that's good news because it means somebody is really doing their work. <laughs> and I want to say that, that not only was Tracy doing good work in contacting me, and I very much appreciate being part of that exhibition, but she has curated an absolutely fabulous and important exhibition which is up at the uh, Newberger Museum. And I want to thank you for it, Tracy. And I, I think if you haven't been there, you should really make the trip up to see it. It will be up until January 25th. And I thank you for inviting me to participate in it. 
and I thank you for participating today. And we hope we're going to get this after, uh, uh, through this afternoon <laughs> without having to call an ambulance. <laughs> because uh, I'm going to introduce um, Tracy Fitzpatrick plus one, and Dr. Fitzpatrick is a curator at the Neuberger Museum of Art and an assistant professor in art history in the undergraduate program and the master's degree program in modern and contemporary art, criticism, and theory at Purchase College SUNY. Combining curatorial work with curricular initiatives, Fitzpatrick organizes exhibitions and teaches in the areas of modern American art and museology. Fitzpatrick has curated many exhibitions, including Facing Abstractions, Refiguring the Body in the 20th Century in 2006, Underground Art, a Centennial Celebration of the New York City Subway, 2005, Another Dimension, uh, sculptures and printmaking and artful adv advocacy, cartoons from the women's suffrage movement. Her forthcoming book, Art and the Subway, which will be, um, is that it's Art and the uh, Subway New York Underground, right, will be released in spring of 2009 and I very much look forward to seeing that. She is a recipient of uh, fellowships from the Mellon Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation of the American Council of Learned Societies. She is, of course, a member of the AAM, Art Table, and all of those organizations that we all know and love. So she received her PhD from Rutgers University, also a great sister to this museum. And I'd like you to um, assist me in welcoming Tracy Fitzpatrick, plus one. Welcome. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And I want to thank you um, so much for, for being so generous with your support for the, I don't want to knock these cords down, with, uh, for the exhibition and for inviting me here today. And Lauren also, thank you so much for all of your help. Um, just put this here so I can put my water on it. And put this microphone on, which I was told to do. So um, this talk is derived from my work on the exhibition, Hanawogi Gestures, which is on view at the Neuberger until the 25th. I'm sorry for, um, I don't usually sit when I'm giving a public presentation, but I think if you'll excuse me, in my current condition will all be better off if I sit while I'm talking. Um, I've been interested in Wilkie's work for, for a long time and the aspect of it um, that has interested me most recently is really the idea behind the exhibition, which is that she's generally thought of mainly as a performance artist, mainly as a photographer, and that somehow the kind of the roots of her practice as a sculptor seem to sort of fall by the wayside. So the, the idea behind the exhibition is to retrace those roots, recover some of that practice, and then link it to the performance to the photography, link it really to almost every aspect of, um, of what she did. Um, I, I think that the, the definitions of her as a performance artist, as a photographer, are a little bit um, narrow, and that it's possible that this has occurred or these, the, these definitions have emerged because of the way people have written about her work, because of the way her photographs, particularly um, the photographs from her Intravenous series, her last body of work, were, have been distributed um, in, in journals and magazines and so forth. A lot of these um, kinds of objects, for example, the Intravenous series was when it was originally exhibited, it was shown with sculptural components like the black one and why not sneeze, but people don't see the installation shots of the way these objects were originally shown. They really just see the photographs. And so I think this is, um, this has contributed to the loss of um, thinking about her really as a sculptor. The why not sneeze, by the way, is related to the Duchamp piece, Why Not Sneeze, and Duchamp was one of the, um, one of Wilkie's very important um, sources. 
Hannah Wilkie created sculpture through gestures, um, simple folds of movements, or simple folds and movements of materials, whether it was clay or bubble gum or, or Play-Doh, it was really gestures that turned them, um, and herself, I'll argue, in, the, in this talk, into sculpture. And here you see her in her studio in a kind of sea of her clay folds. And she produced these folds throughout her, throughout her career. She began experimenting um, with both radical form and content at a young age, um, continuing this path as an undergraduate major, a sculpture major at Tyler School of Art at Temple University. She graduated from there in 1962 with a Bachelor's of Fine Arts and a Bachelor of Science in Education. And some of the earliest sculptures that she produced there, um, like this two-part on the left, this two-piece untitled work from about 1960, um, were fashioned out of plaster of Paris. These are very sort of crackly looking works. They have very fragile surfaces. Um, you can see when you look closely at a work like this, you can actually see the artist's fingerprints left in the plaster where she was working it while it was still um, wet. Uh, this is figurative and abstract. The work on the right is an example of painted fiberglass and metal, the anthropophonic form for 1963. This is another material that Wilkie worked in very early in her career. Um, Wilkie described these works as, as quote, abstracted arm and leg-like structures reaching up with big separate centers connecting them. And they do kind of look like, a, or this one does look like a sort of overgrown flower and the surface is um, very mottled with these very um, rich kinds of greens, and you see the tentacles that are extruding from it. Now, after working for a period of time using plaster, using fiberglass, uh, she determined that these, these materials were not malleable enough. And she had also been working with clay, and it's about at this moment when she really turns to clay um, as a mainstay of her work. And among the earliest examples of her use of clay are these very small, delicate forms she called blooms or boxes, which is a, a pun uh, on contemporary slang for the word vagina. And almost all of the works that Wilkie did during this period were abstracted images of the body, particularly vaginal forms. Um, to give shape to female desire, to give shape to sexual fulfillment, the anthropophonic form also. Um, it has a kind of a secret. You can just make out in the center of it, you can see the white table underneath it. Um, it has a kind of secret center to it, um, but it's hidden by these petal-like fo petal -like folds, and these were definitely images of the female body um, uh, that Wilkie was making during this time. The boxes, and here you see one of her clay boxes from the early 1960s. Um, there are these sort of deep caverns. They're constructed of layers of clay, sometimes with these, you can see in the detail, these little slits at the bottom. Um, built up by these overlapping layers where she would, in this particular case, add texture to the clay by pressing burlap or some other kind of fabric into the clay while it's still wet. At first she was quite reticent to talk about her, uh, talk about the content of her work. Um, she would explain it to her peers in school and otherwise, but she rarely revealed the subject matter of the work to her teachers at Tyler or to her earliest employers. She was quite fearful of, um, um, of people knowing what it was that she was making imagery of. And of course, this is very early. This is in the 1960s, um, not the 1970s, when it becomes more commonplace um, for women, particularly of the feminist art movement, to make imagery 
like this. She was also quite reticent to reveal what she was making, the content of the work, to the art world at large. Um, she later observed in 1974 that in the early 60s, she says, in the early 60s, I was scared to show my work around because you were put down if you were making images of female genitalia. Her work and the complications surrounding her revealing its contents to her teachers, her employees, <laughs> demonstrate some of the key problems and paradoxes that feminist artists working later in the 1970s would face as they argued against perceptions of gender and gendered roles through the use of clearly gendered forms. Negotiating um, through varied artistic and conceptual concerns, Wilkie was always adventurous, exceptionally adventurous in her explore, exploration of sculptural process. And there was simply nothing that was out of bounds for her in her search for malleable materials. Um, in the 1970s, for example, she, she molded this raw bacon on a plate um, on the right-hand side, you see one of many little um, Play-Doh folds that she created, kind of emphasizing the playfulness of her work. And um, she made kind of families of this. So this blue, this is basically, it's a, um, a, a, um, a round of blue and white and yellow Play-Doh that she rolled out and then turned into a fold. These are, th these are by far the most fragile objects or the most fragile material that she worked in, I think. Even, we'll talk about the latex in a minute, but even more fragile than the latex. This is, uh, of anything that's on view in the exhibition at the Newburger right now, this is the piece that I most fear something <laughs> happening to. They're just incredibly fragile. I mentioned the latex a minute ago, and um, th this is one of the earliest materials that she that she worked in, this um, liquid latex. And she, would, she would create small folds out of the liquid latex. She would um, pour it over uh, clay folds. She would pour it over uh, lengths of twine. She would pour it out on a plaster of Paris surface. And the plaster of Paris would kind of suck some of the moisture out of it and make it easier to work with. Um, among the more unusual examples of the small fold or the teasel cushion, I'm sorry I don't have a picture of that, but it's a small work from 1967 that she actually placed on top of um, uh, artificial turf, which um, was a very unusual material for artists to be working with at the time, uh, something that emerged in the early 1960s and became popularized as a substitute for grass when it was installed in the Houston Astrodome, Astrodome for the first time in 1965. She would also create these very large wall pieces, um, um, pouring, the li pouring the latex into rounds, bending it like clay, and then using snaps and push pins to, to piece, the pe piece the objects together. Some of them are very large centerfold for example, an early latex work was 12 feet high and 5 feet wide. The, the, unfortunately, the, the latex formula, formula that she used at first was not stable. And so most of the, almost all of the latex pieces that she made up until about 1974 have either disintegrated or become so fragile that they can no longer be exhibited. In 75, she changed her formula, and Ver Vertical Verde for Garcia Lorca is an example of one of the pieces from that period of time based on a, um, one of her, uh, a stanza from a poem by one of her favorite poets, uh, Federico Garcia Lorca. And so this is from 1975. And then Rosebud, which is on loan to the Burning Down the House exhibition, I think is also 70. Is that 75 also, I think? 75, 76. So that also survived because it is made from this same new formula. She, she used a new formula of latex and then combined it with Liquitex so that it would strengthen the latex and also give the, allow her to be able to, um, to tint, the, tint the objects. 
works like Rosebud in particular are kind of sensual and fleshy. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's out right, in the, right as you first walk into the exhibition here. Um, it has sort of soft petal-like folds, which are very kind of vulnerable in appearance. In, in 1972, the critic Douglas Crimp described the early versions of these very vulnerable looking objects as um, not only vulnerable in their ability to be undone, unsnapped, but also to be, um, uh, that they were sort of crying out to be touched. The vulnerability that, of Wilkie's work, which Crimp observed, was particularly important or became particularly important to her artistic production. So bacon, raw bacon would rot, um, the thin rounds of Play-Doh could crack under the slightest amount of pressure. She observed in 1975, um, the same year she began working with the new latex formula, quote, one strength of American art right now is that we're involved in a culture that's about destructiveness. Some of the best art has a planned obsolescence. So although she didn't know that her earliest latex pieces would fall apart, it was something that she not only endured, but also eventually came to appreciate as a critical part of her, of her process. This idea of vulnerability, um, of potential violation, is a, a theme that runs through her body of work particularly in objects that appear fragile, um, easily torn, broken. And, um, but it's important to remember that she, Wilkie, the artist is always in control to a certain degree of those objects that appear fragile, of that violation. One of the ways that she explored this idea was to start exhibiting work on the floor. And um, she did this for the first time in an exhibition in 1974 at Ronald Feldman Fine Art called The Floor Show. And this is one of the most unusual um, works that she exhibited in The Floor Show. You can see the installation shot in 1974 and then recent photography of, the, of this work called Laundry Lint COs. Um, that's how it looks right now at the New in the Newberger exhibition and the detail of one of the pieces in the upper right hand corner. This is um, long, this is made from literally from laundry lint, nothing else, that she collected over the course of about two or three years from her then partner Klaus Oldenburg's dryer. And she essentially followed the same methodology that she had used in the other the work that she, the other folded work, like the clay works and so forth, she would essentially fold flat lengths of this compressed laundry lint into objects, um, and then here again exhibiting on the floor. They're very kind of surprising when you look at them and in, in their material and in how delicate they are. Um, they give the appearance of being very easily broken apart, very easily um, able to disintegrate. And at the same time, they're remarkable for their color. They have this extraordinarily vivid color. If you think about laundry lint and the laundry lint that comes out of your own dryer, it probably doesn't always have this bright, beautiful pink hue or yellow hue. Mine does not. It tends to be rather gray. So it's, it's remarkable that the lint looks the way it does. And it has you know what lint has in it. It has fibers and labels and hair. and and dust, and it is one of the ways in which she addressed feminist concerns uh, because, of course, she's essentially seizing the garbage of women's labor, doing the laundry, certainly what was construed as women's labor at that time, um, and converting it into this creative production. This is another piece that she showed um, in the floor show. Uh, 176 one-fold gestural sculptures. This is a group of sculptures that vary in size um, from just an inch to over five inches in, in width or length placed at, in random patterns on the floor. Some of the forms are open, some are closed, some are smooth, some are very 
craggy. Together they create a kind of um, sea of clay forms. It was first shown as 176 one full gestural sculptures and now is shown as 159 one full gestural sculptures. Very, very vulnerable, um, very uh, like the Play-Doh, kind of frightening to a curator installing in their exhibition space because it just sits directly on the floor and you can um, walk right up to it and um, it, 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 it is a good demonstration of the way she turned to work that has a kind of vulnerability to it or experimented with that. And then another very unusual um, material that she installed on the floor um, in that exhibition was a long line of store-bought fortune cookies. In the 70s, she began purchasing cookies. She would um, keep them in her studio, and they would sort of, um, according to her account, slowly disappear, probably um, being taken by small creatures that would come into the studio at night. and, and um, borrow them or nibble on them. Uh, she saw the cookies as being um, very related to the folds that she was making visually, conceptually, and they also are extremely, extremely fragile. The idea of buying store-bought objects or prefabricated objects um, and exhibiting them as her own work of art was, of course, a conceptual act, something that we now term appropriation. Um, art and clearly inspired by Duchamp again, who was, as I mentioned before, sort of touchstone for, for, for Wilkie. Of course, some of his best known pieces, his store-bought urinal, his store-bought bicycle wheel and stool, um, were works that he sometimes modified, referred to as ready-mades. And really, um, what Wilkie's fortune cookies are, are, are ready-mades in the spirit of Duchamp. Just some other materials that she worked in. Um, these are works made out of kneaded eraser. She not only loved work that was conceptually challenging, but also loved language and wordplay. Puns were a staple of her work. She used, um, this is among her earliest uses of wordplay, the, the, the kneaded eraser series, which she also exhibited in the floor show. She would fold these very small, um, uh, f sm make these small folded sculptures out of varying sized kneaded erasers and place them on square boards. The color of the erasers vary from work to work. Color of kneaded erasers vary from eraser to eraser. Some are very, very tiny, only an eighth of an inch wide. Um, some are arranged in random patterns, as you can see in the work on the left, number four, or arranged in a grid pattern, as you can see in the work on the right. The, the kneaded erasers don't um, dry. They're pliable, just like clay. They are typically used for the removal of graphite or charcoal, um, or as a method of subtractive drawing in which the artist would actually erase, use the eraser to lighten or remove elements of drawing. Um, they are unique um, in that they will absorb, unlike other erasers, they will actually absorb the color of the thing that they are erasing. So they, um, they change color, they always stay the same size, but they will wear out from overuse, becoming less pliable and less absorbent. So she's really shifting the use of a tool for correction or subtraction to a tool of sculptural construction. And as she adopts the kneaded eraser, she, she not only modifies its use, but she also draws on it conceptually as she puns the word kneaded eraser. So, um, you know, in the 1970s when she's making this work, the idea of erasure would have been particularly important to those interested in reinserting women into the, the art historical canon. Um, there's also sort of the more personal aspect of it as um, referencing her um, experiences in romantic relationships. Um, she used needed erasers in other ways. She used them on postcards. It's an example of a, just one of the postcards, Franklin's Tomb of 1976. She used them on utensils, and here you see knife and fork 
1974, and Saucer and Spoon of 1974, both of which are on view in the exhibition. The work on the right, I believe, has not been shown before, so it's exciting for us to have that piece in the show. Um, these are works that evoke surrealist objects, and surrealism was something that was also very important to Wilkie, and here, uh, just an example, I'm showing you Merritt Oppenheim's object from 19. 36, this fur line cup, saucer, and spoon, which is the kind of object that would have influenced Wilkie and her, her thinking about the pieces at the top. Kneading, whether it was kneading clay, kneading eraser, was um, something to which she was clearly very devoted. And among the um, materials that she eventually needed was, was her own skin. Um, and this is a still from a video uh, called Gestures from 1974. It was also included in the floor show. And you're seeing um, a still and then photo photographic stills turned into a series of photographs on the right-hand side. This was this is a 35 minute video, 35 plus minute video, um, really one of her first uses of video. And um, here she manipulates her flesh in the way that she manipulated all other malleable materials, really sculpting it into form. So she would just sort of knead her face over and over and over again, creating different gestures and different, different facial features and expressions. After gestures, she uses her body, uh, she continued to use her body as sculptural material. And this is a performance she did in 1974 called Super Tart. It was part of a multimedia event held at the kitchen in New York City where um, many, many artists were invited to give these kind of two minute performances. And here you're seeing stills from the performance. Super Tart was um, a pun on the title of the event, Soup and Tart. Um, a pun on the popular rock musical Jesus Christ Superstar that the rock opera opened in 71 and was released as a film in 73 just before the year before she did this performance. For the performance she, stand, she stood on a little um, on top of a little pedestal draped with this white tablecloth worn over her shoulder and over the course of the two minutes she struck a series of poses or tableaus moving the cloth, her torso, her limbs, and her facial expression. Now she, she described this work as a transformation from the Virgin Mary in the upper left-hand corner to the crucified Christ um, in the lower right-hand corner. And you can see how she rolls up the material so it creates a kind of loincloth around her body in the final image from, that was taken from that performance, and so she's using, um, she's querying ideas about the boundaries of religion and faith and the body within the framework of Christianity. And at the same time, I think that this work can be placed squarely within um, ancient Greek sculptural traditions, which is something that's not talked about um, with reference to Wilkie's work all that often. By the time that she produced this, she was well aware of Greco-Roman sculpture. She had traveled to Greece. She had been to the British Museum, which of course has um, many, many examples of Greek, Greek sculpture. She had been to the antiquities, seen the antiquities in the original Getty Mansion during a trip to Los Angeles. Um, super tart is particularly reminiscent to my eye of Hellenistic traditions and um, Wilkie's gestures in the performance and in the stills that she chose from the performance to create the photographic version of the event evoke a spirit of Hellenistic pathos in sculpture. And the Hellenistic world um, sought the expression of emotions that were both transitory and fleeting. And um, in sculpture, those were rendered in kind of pantomimic, through pantomimic gesture, pantomimic posing um, that were both dramatic and exaggerated. And those are the kinds of gestures that, um, that Wilkie's creating in the super tart performance. So her, her use of what's called pathos, um, this, this what's called the pathetic approach, not in the way we think of 
pathetic now, but linking to the word pathos, um, was reinforced by her use of the, the drapery, and in this case, the white tablecloth. One of the things that Greek sculpture was most praised for um, was the way in we the way in which Greek sculptors evoked what's, what's called empnus in their work. And this was the idea of a sculpture that was full of life or full of breath, literally full of breath. And this was a level of sculptural accuracy that most um, all Greek sculptors aspired to. And there was a kind of magic deemed um, a magic to the sculptures where a sculpture that appeared um, almost animated, lifelike, and here we, we see Wilkie making these life sculptures, these living sculptures. Um, this is something that was highly, highly praised among the Greek, the Greek world. There was also ecratic writing um, about these sculptors, meaning writing in the arts about how these sculptures looked as though they were literally alive and that they, they required, sometimes required watchful eyes or they required being chained to their pedestals so that they wouldn't just leap up and run off. Um, an example, often cited example, is a, a, a marble cow by the sculptor Myron, which was on the Acropolis. Acropolis in Athens, and according to descriptions of the cow, the cow was so lifelike that shepherd boys would try to yoke it, and calves would try to suckle from it, um, bulls would try to mount it. Um, there's no particular evidence that Wilkie was thinking about this particular aspect of Greek sculpture when she made these works, um, but there's no question that her idea, her use of the Greek tradition um, and thinking about the way she positioned her body and the way she used drapery um, uh, is rooted in that tradition of the living sculpture, the kind of Greco-Roman living sculpture. This was also tied to the way in which marble gods and goddesses were treated. So, for example, on the left, you're looking at a, a, just a, a votive that's reflective of the, the way the Arthena, Athena Parthenos would have looked like. And then on the right is the Aphrodite of Nidos. Um, these are among the most renowned representations of marble gods and goddesses who were treated like real human beings, and they were made offerings to in their temples. They were literal inhabitants of their temples. So they were prayed to, they were adorned, they were provided offerings, sometimes ritualistically bathed. In several of her living sculpture projects, she transformed herself into a goddess, often the goddess of love and beauty, Venus, um, the Roman version of the Greek Aphrodite. And this is a recurrent theme throughout her work, she produced latex pieces in the early 70s, Venus Basin, Venus Cushion. Um, for the Greek world, Aphrodite had multiple links to this idea of a living sculpture. It was Aphrodite who, according to legend, inspired the sculptor Pygmalion to fabricate his ideal woman out of, out of ivory, naming her Galatea. Pygmalion fell in love with his creation, prayed to Aphrodite, who then brought the work to life. Um, in the fourth century, Praxiteles' Aphrodite of Nidos was so shocking, it so shocked Greek society um, because it was one of the first full size, life size representations of the female nude. And there is writing about the Aphrodite of Nidos, similar to the writing about the cow, um, where she had you know, very dewy eyes um, that the marble created. Uh, um, created a kind of um, sensuality that hadn't been seen in sculpture like this before. And she used the Venus, uh, Wilkie used the Venus figure in other life sculpture projects that she did, um, one in, a, um, in an event called Life Sculpture that was orchestrated by Lil Picard at Sculpture Now in 1974, another that same year where she was um, also posed as Venus as a life sculpture um, 
in an event called Wait, um, Wait Sheets and Quiet Dots. And then one of her um, best known performances on July 4th, 1976, she performed My Country Tis of Thee um, at the Albright Knox Museum. Um, there were earlier versions of this. She performed it first for cable television, or a version of it for cable television at an artist's rights exhibition in 1975, then at the Whitney in another version of this in um, 1976. And for the Buffalo Project, which is her most fully formed version of the idea, she placed these three 11-foot goddess photographs of herself along the south facade of the museum in front of for Caryatids um, by Augustus St. Gaudens. The, the Albright Knox Museum model, being modeled after the Erechtheion in Greece. Um, and here, clearly, she's, she's repeating patterns that you can see. It's hard to see in the image on the left, but she's repeating um, patterns. Let's see, I think I have another. Yeah, you can see she's repeating the drapery um, in the photographs that she has on the lower half of her body. Those are repeating, that's repeating the drapery that the, that the caryatids, the, the, um, the female figures that literally hold up the facade of the building, that, that they are also wearing. And then on the left hand side you see her um, uh, during the um, My Country Tis of the creating ch a chewing gum freeze. So she's working on the sidewalk with people walking by, lots of children, other, other people where they would come and they would chew gum and then she would form little sculptures out of it, chewing gum being one of her um, other signature materials that she worked with. She would take the, the chewed gum, create the little sculptures, put them on rag board, and then you see how she arranged the rag board around the building as a kind of a, a frieze. Um, the frieze, she, she observed, that the frieze that she created was a way in which to, quote, put color back into the architecture. And of course, she's referencing the way in which ancient buildings, Greco-Roman buildings, which now appear white to us, actually were polychromatic when they were first made. The frieze is not only um, a way in which to embellish the building, but also links to, links through her love of language to a pun, and here she's of course, punning the, the song, um, you know, the traditional patriotic song, My Country Tis of Thee. Um, now, the founding of the United, this is, this is the July 4th, 1976, this is the bicentennial, and of course, um, the founding of the United States was, was inspired by Greek ideology, and the link between Greek ideology and American de democracy was manifested in the importation of Greek forms to architecture in the United States in the 19th century. So if you think of the, the mall in Washington, that's all, you know, this Greco-Roman form, that all links back to the way, in our, way our system of de democracy links further back to, the, um, to Greek ideology. She is making a frieze that would essentially take the place of, um, of narrative on a Greek building. So the frieze is the place where you tell the story of the building or tell out some other significant kind of story. Here she's forming a narrative out of these little sculptural folds that she referred to as, quote, cunt forms, um, thus lending architectural and ideological form to her punning the word country. And um, also, Reinscribing, of course, you know, my country tis of the sweet land of liberty of the I sing land where our fathers died. This is a this is a gendered, you know, it's a it's a patriarchal song. It's clearly a gendered song, but actually is a song that's derived from a, gen, a gender neutral song, which is God save the queen or God save the king, depending on what ruler happens to be in um, which which depending on the circumstances of monarchical. Rule. So she's not only reinscribing the, the female into the, this whole patriotic system, but also into, into the anthem itself. Um, her version of My Country Tis of Thee demonstrates the ways in which she not only investigated the body as um, sculpture, but also queried cultural constructions of female beauty. 
and her reliance on ancient Greco-Roman forms, for example, played a critical role in the way she considered how beauty is defined and viewed. And of course, the, there's, a, there's a, the Greek formulation of, of perfection, of correct, perform, per, correct proportion, is a canon that was also a gendered canon. It was based on the male body, the sort of the perfect male body. And um, this is a place in which she, Wilkie, um, uses her work to investigate the notion of perfect and the notion of perfection as a, as a gendered idea and as culturally inscribed. And if you look at um, these two images, a still from Super, T, Super Tart from 1974, and then, a, then one of the photographs from Intravenous, you can see how throughout her body of work, she is um, considering these ideas. So the Super Tart image, she's life, she's nude, with the exception of the fabric from the waist down, um, her shoes, and um, in the, in the um, by contrast, in the intravenous work, which is the last body of work that she does, where she um, effectively documents her own death from lymphoma, lymphoma in 1993, she holds her hands up, she balances an urn of flowers on her head, um, striking the classical caryatid pose again, but this time the nude body is aged, the nude body is bloated, um, dressed not in a skirt or a tablecloth, but covered by bandages near her waist, protecting the wounds from her cancer treatments. And so she is, again, positioning herself as embodying the classical body, the body of Venus, but giving further revision to the way in which she investigates the classical form and, again, queries this idea of the cultural construction of, of perfection and the cultural construction of beauty. The chewing gum that she used in the performance um, in 1976, um, she used that about a year and a half after the first time that she started using chewing gum, which was um, for her SOS Starification Object series. This is a mastication box that she produced in late 1974 in a, uh, for an exhibition called Artists Make Toys, which was on view in January 1975. Um, this is a, uh, an exhibition that had uh, many different kinds of toys by a variety of artists, including Mark DeSuvero. Um, Oldenburg exhibited in this show with Trisha Brown and Jared Bark. They made a, um, a four-foot house that opened up, a four-foot horse that opened up to reveal a theater inside. And then Red Grooms, another artist who part participated in this show, made a, a giant wooden picture puzzle. Her box, the mastication box, had these unopened um, uh, chewing gums, um, of different kinds of flavors and brands, these tiny gum sculptures encased in plexiglass boxes, playing cards, and these 28, 28 of these little photographs you see in the lower right of her with gum. She's, she's in, in various poses with gum attached to her, attached to her body. And um, by placing the gum on her body and then having herself photographed for the mastication box, she really um, made a kind of final collapse between her body and her sculpture. And she observed in an artist's round table in 1975, um, my chewing gum sculpture is about me, my body and me. I make body art where I put chewing gum sculptures on my body. I become my art, my art becomes me. And it was from the mastication box that um, several other works and ideas emerged. Here you see, um, in 1975, she was invited to participate in an exhibition um, in Paris. And um, there, the, this wonderful description of um, what occurred when she went there and did her performance with the chewing gum, Wilkie arrived with no less than 3,000 pieces of brightly colored gum unavailable in Paris. And that's true that, that these kinds of colors that she was using in her gum were only available in the United States. And did a three-hour performance at the opening. Amid nonstop television cameras and flashing bulbs, she offered super cherry, apple green, and chocolate flavored gum to the elegantly attired guests.
desks. The chewed pieces were either returned to Wilkie, who rapidly molded them into 120 sexual sculptures, pushed pinned to the wall, or fastened to the artist's half-nude body. So she saw the gum as not only a part of herself, but also a part of the people who participated in the SOS project. Um, as she said, people chew the gum for me. I make, the, I make an object from the chewed gum, which contains remnants of their saliva. After the gum's sweetness is removed, part of their body was in the object, which was later preserved on paper as sculptural drawing. And so it's in this way that, that her body not only becomes part of her art, but also the bodies of her audience. In the SOS project, starification was a pun on the word scarification. Um, throughout the course of her career, she framed the use of scarification in the SOS series in several ways. She linked the practice of scarring to tattoo numbers with which Jews were marked in concentration camps. And as she observed, as a Jew, quote, I would have been destroyed had I been born in Europe at that time. She also related her scarification through gum to the practice of African scarification in which the body is incised with a sharp tool to create patterning and to create gendered stereotypes. Um, I decorated, she said, my body, this is her uh, quote from her, um, I decorated my body relating to the African scarification wounds or to the caste system or macho male photographs with cowboy hats and guns or little uniforms, maid outfits and hair curlers so that they were psychological poses that related to me as emotional wounds that we carry within us that really hurt us. These kinds of scars as they pertain to Jews in the Holocaust or um, in um, African culture were um, modification, they were permanent modifications of the body that fixed a kind of status of the scar, a kind of social status or status otherwise, um, sometimes linked to female sexuality, indicating particularly in African culture stages of adolescence and puberty. In Wilkie's, in Wilkie's version, the scars are not fixed, They're, they are temporary, they can be removed at any time. The SOS series is often linked to the way in which her own body was marked with her battle with, um, marked by her battle with lymphoma, and also the way in which her mother's body was marked through her battle, through her battle with breast cancer. Um, this is a work called In Memoriam, Selma Butter Mommy, from 1979 to 1983. Her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1970. Um, underwent a, 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 a radical double mastectomy. And as her, as Wilkie's sister, Marcy Charlotte, observed to me, um, she said, we were both devastated. When she had the surgery, the surgery was on Hannah's 30th birthday, she said, in those days, a woman was put to sleep not knowing if she would awaken without a breast. Wilkie didn't often link the SOS series to her illness, at least to, um, to critics really until later, um, it was really not until she ma started making photographs of her mother um, after her mother suffered a stroke and that prompted her cancer to return that she began to link the SOS series to the way in which her mother's body was ravaged by her illness, um, the way in which her mother's body had disintegrated, um, and then later uh, the link being made to the way in which her own body would disintegrate from her own illness. Given her concern with concerns for fragility, impermanence, changeability, disintegration, it, it may seem and certainly did to me at first illogical that her sculptural practice was also largely concerned with monumental art, with public art, um, which is probably the least well-known aspect of her practice. Um, at the same time, she was, like most artists, very concerned about her artistic legacy and focused, um, I think, far more attention on this uh, monumental pu public sculpture aspect of her work than, than is, is known. She, in 1978, 1979, experimented with casting in a foundry while she was an artist in residence at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. Um, 
and uh, it was there that she created bronze models as proposals for monumental sculptures. What I'm showing you here are some cast bronze folds that she created while she was learning how to work in the foundry. Another example of a work that she produced um, as a, a monumental sculpture, this is Color Fields, Monument for Large Sculpture at Federal Plaza of 1985. This is a, a work that was produced for an exhibition called After Tilted Arc that was held at the storefront for art and architecture in New York City in November 1985. And uh, it was earlier that year that a Manhattan jury ordered the removal of Richard Serra's 1981 Tilted Arc, which you see in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, the exhibition, uh, according to the organizers, was not intended to be critical of Serra, or his sculpture, but rather to redirect the argument surrounding the piece because the argument had become so heated and divis divisive. Um, they really wanted to engage in a discussion about what is public art, um, what work can be accepted and understood by viewers, what is the artist's responsibility. And this is Wilkie's contribution to the exhibition, these um, um, 10 what would have been large scale paintings of colorful folds shown in a, in a grid parent pattern. And just a couple of other examples of her interest in monumental sculpture. This is a, a, a drawing for a proposal for a sculpture on a golf course. These had a kind of humorous side to them. Um, and you can see uh, the drawing on the lower right hand showing you the models for soft pyramids which are tiny, tiny little models made out of various materials, bronze, um, lead. Uh, these, are, these are undated. And so experimenting with what a golf course would look like if she was given the opportunity to create her monumental sculpture on the golf course. And then the Sotheby's um, series, um, these are a group of five drawings that she created um, in which she adorned advertisements for estate properties being marketed by this high-end um, realtor with drawings for monumental sculpture. The, um, and you can see on the right-hand side, she's, she's essentially showing you, you know, what your, what your big estate would look like if you gave her the opportunity to build her large sculpture on your front lawn or on your beachfront property over on the left-hand side. In the largest drawing in the series, the one in the center, she quotes a passage from Karl Marx's Das Kapital, um, which was published in 1867 as a criticism of the way in which capitalism had redefined commodities from the purchase and sale of goods to the purchase and sale of labor. And this is something that, um, this idea of, his idea of exchange value is something that she um, addressed over and over throughout her body of work, this idea of, um, um, of uh, using Marx's name as a pun. Um, she's punning his name. She's leaving her own Marx on the estate. And um, uh, also um, sort of querying her role as a, as a laborer, um, um, uh, as someone, as, a, as, a, as an artist who is marketed and who has to market her work. Um, in conclusion, making her mark on the landscape, on her body in clay, bacon, Play-Doh, Hannah Wilkie was always concerned with the sculptural quality of her work. It was, I believe, always an underlying theme and methodology that permeated almost, um, almost everything that she did from her uh, earliest sculpture all the way through to the, 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 her final series, the, the, uh, the intravenous works. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have time for questions? I'd be happy to answer questions or, or stay a minute after if you don't want to. Yeah. Did she ever realize any monumental no, I forgot. I should have put that in the beginning. No, it's a very good question. Not, no, not, not as far as I know. Although I have been asked, 
if maybe the Newburger would like to pay for that. I don't think the Newburger wants to pay for that though, but it has come up. <laughs> Are there any proposals that they would like to like to support? Anything else? Thank you very much. No, I, I oh, I'm sorry. Sculpture specific, but yeah. I've been wondering about why she changed her name that Wilkie was not actually. Well, Wilkie is her married name. Oh, and okay. Hannah, okay. Hannah, her, her first husband, and then Hannah was her middle name. So I think she, she, her, her first, uh, her original, her given name was Arlene Hannah Butter, and she did um, kind of work with that name Butter um, uh, because butter can be easily spread. She, she writes about that in, in any. My son's in the room now, so I'm not going to go any further into that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sure. I'd like to thank Tracy for um, venturing out on the eve of her new son's arrival. Not the actual eve. <laughs> the, <laughs> the metaphorical eve. The metaphorical <laughs> eve. And for, for the information and bringing to life and to light uh, some more, uh, you know, uh, dimensions, I think, of Hannah Wilkie and her artwork. Um, Stephen Solland, who is a male feminist artist who is in this show, uh, Burning Down the House, um, uh, building a, a um, feminist art collection here at the center, is going to be lecturing here this evening at the Forum at 7 o'clock. And next Saturday, December 13th, Gloria Steinem is moderating Sex Trafficking, The New Abolitionists with a wonderful panel and it will be in the Cantor Auditorium on the third floor, and we're going to have then a reception here at the center uh, immediately afterwards. And Sunday, uh, December 14th, here in the Forum, Jennifer Cody Epstein is going to be here reading from and discussing her novel, uh, The Painter from Shanghai. So again, I thank you very much, Tracy, and thank you all for uh, being here this afternoon and enjoy the day. Thank you.